You're listening to a Swift Sojourner production. Check out Swift Sojourner on YouTube, Twitter, and SoundCloud for more audio delights. Enjoy the show! Armageddon 2419 AD by Philip Francis Nolan Read by Swift Sojourner Foreword Elsewhere I have set down, for whatever interest they have in this, the 25th century, my personal recollections of the 20th century. Now it occurs to me that my memoirs of the 25th century may have an equal interest 500 years from now, particularly in view of the unique perspective from which I have seen the 25th century, entering it as I did in one leap across a gap of 492 years. This statement requires elucidation. There are still many in the world who are not familiar with my unique experience. Five centuries from now there may be many more, especially if civilization is fated to endure any worse convulsions than those which have occurred between 1975 AD and the present time. I should state, therefore, that I, Anthony Rogers, am, so far as I know, the only man alive whose normal span of 81 years of life has been spread over a period of 573 years. To be precise, I lived the first 29 years of my life between 1898 and 1927, the other 52 since 2419. The gap between these two, a period of nearly 500 years, I spent in a state of suspended animation, free from the ravages of catabolic processes, and without any apparent effect on my physical or mental faculties. When I began my long sleep, man had just begun his real conquest of the air in a sudden series of transoceanic flights in airplanes driven by internal combustion motors. He had barely begun to speculate on the possibilities of harnessing subatomic forces and had made no further practical penetration into the field of ethereal pulsations than the primitive radio and television of the day. The United States of America was the most powerful nation in the world, its political, financial, industrial, and scientific influence being supreme, and in the arts also it was rapidly climbing into leadership. I awoke to find the America I knew a total wreck, to find Americans a hunted race in their own land, hiding in the dense forests that covered the shattered and levelled ruins of their once magnificent cities, desperately preserving and struggling to develop in their secret retreats the remnants of their culture and science and the undying flame of their sturdy independence. World domination was in the hands of the Mongolians, and the centre of world power lay in inland China, with Americans one of the few races of mankind unsubdued. And it must be admitted, in fairness to the truth, not worth the trouble of subduing in the eyes of the Han airlords who ruled North America as titular tributaries of the most magnificent. For they needed not the forests in which the Americans lived, nor the resources of the vast territories these forests covered. With the perfection to which they had reduced the synthetic production of necessities and luxuries, their remarkable development of scientific processes and mechanical accomplishment of work, they had no economic need for the forests and no economic desire for the enslaved labour of an unruly race. They had all they needed for their magnificently luxurious and degraded scheme of civilization within the walls of the fifteen cities of sparkling glass they had flung skyward on the sites of ancient American centres, into the bowels of the earth underneath them, and with relatively small surrounding areas of agriculture. Complete domination of the air rendered communication between these centres a matter of ease and safety. Occasional destructive raids on the wastelands were considered all that was necessary to keep the wild Americans on the run within the shelter of their forests, and prevent their becoming a menace to the Han civilization. But nearly 300 years of easily maintained security, the last century of which had been nearly sterile in scientific, social, and economic progress, had softened and devitalized the Han. It had likewise developed, beneath the protecting foliage of the forest, the growth of a vigorous new American civilization, remarkable in the mobility and flexibility of its organization, in its conquest of almost insuperable obstacles, in the development and guarding of its industrial and scientific resources, all in anticipation of that day of hope to which it had been looking forward to generations, 
when it would be strong enough to burst forth from the green chrysalis of the forests, soar into the upper air lanes and destroy the yellow incubus. At the time I awoke, the day of hope was almost at hand. I shall not attempt to set forth a detailed history of the Second War of Independence, for that has been recorded already by better historians than I am. Instead, I shall confine myself largely to the part I was fortunate enough to play in this struggle and in the events leading up to it. It all resulted from my interest in radioactive gases. During the latter part of 1927, my company, the American Radioactive Gas Corporation, had been keeping me busy investigating reports of unusual phenomena observed in certain abandoned coal mines near the Wyoming Valley in Pennsylvania. With two assistants, and a complete equipment of scientific instruments, I began the exploration of a deserted working in a mountainous district, where several weeks before, a number of mining engineers had reported traces of carnitite, and what they believed to be radioactive gases. On the morning of December the 15th, we descended to one of the lower levels. To our surprise, we found no water there. Obviously, it had drained off through some break in the strata. We noticed, too, that the rock in the side walls of the shaft was soft, evidently due to the radioactivity, and pieces crumbled underfoot rather easily. We made our way cautiously down the shaft, when suddenly the rotted timbers above us gave way. I jumped ahead, barely escaping the avalanche of coal and soft rock, but my companions, who were several paces behind me, were buried under it, and undoubtedly met instant death. I was trapped. Return was impossible. With my electric torch I explored the shaft to its end, but could find no other way out. The air became increasingly difficult to breathe, probably from the rapid accumulation of the radioactive gas. In a little while, my senses reeled and I lost consciousness. When I awoke, there was a cool and refreshing circulation of air in the shaft. I had no thought that I had been unconscious for more than a few hours. Although, it seems that the radioactive gas had kept me in a state of suspended animation for something approaching 500 years. My awakening, I figured out later, had been due to some shifting of the strata which reopened the shaft and cleared the atmosphere in the working. This must have been the case, for I was able to struggle back up the shaft over a pile of debris and stagger up the long incline to the mouth of the mine, where an entirely different world, overgrown with a vast forest, and no visible sign of human habitation met my eyes. I shall pass over the days of mental agony that followed in my attempt to grasp the meaning of it all. There were times when I felt that I was on the verge of insanity. I roamed the unfamiliar forest like a lost soul. Had it not been for the necessity of improvising traps and crude clubs with which to slay my food, I believe I should have gone mad. Suffice it to say, however, that I survived this psychic crisis. I shall begin my narrative proper with my first contact with Americans of the year 2419 AD. Chapter 1. The Floating Men My first glimpse of a human being of the 25th century was obtained through a portion of woodland where the trees were thinly scattered, with a dense forest beyond. I had been wandering along aimlessly and hopelessly, musing over my strange fate, when I noticed a figure that cautiously backed out of the dense growth across the glade. I was about to call out joyfully, but there was something furtive about the figure that prevented me. The boy's attention, for it seemed to be a lad of fifteen or sixteen, was centred tensely on the heavy growth of trees from which he had just emerged. He was clad in a rather tight-fitting garment entirely of green, and wore a helmet-like cap of the same colour. High around his waist, he wore a broad, thick belt, which bulked up in the back across the shoulders, into something of the proportions of a knapsack. As I was taking in these details, there came a vivid flash and heavy detonation, not unlike that of a hand grenade, not far to the left of him. He threw up an arm, and staggered a bit in a queer, gliding way. Then he recovered himself, and slipped cautiously away from the place of the explosion, crouching slightly and still facing the denser part of the forest. Every few steps he would raise his arm and point into the forest with something he held in his hand. Wherever he pointed there was a terrific explosion, 
deeper in among the trees. It came to me then that he was shooting with some form of pistol, though there was neither flash nor detonation from the muzzle of the weapon itself. After firing several times, he seemed to come to a sudden resolution, and turning in my general direction, leaped, to my amazement, sailing through the air between the sparsely scattered trees in such a jump as I had never in my life seen before. That leap must have carried him a full fifty feet, although at the height of his arc he was not more than ten or twelve feet from the ground. When he alighted, his foot caught in a projecting root, and he sprawled gently forward. I say gently, for he did not crash down as I expected him to do. The only thing I could compare it with was a slow-motion cinema, although I had never seen one in which horizontal motions were registered at normal speed, and only the vertical movements were slowed down. Due to my surprise, I suppose my brain did not function with its normal quickness, for I gazed at the prone figure for several seconds before I saw the blood that oozed out from under the tight green cap. Regaining my power of action, I dragged him out of sight back of the big tree. For a few moments, I busied myself in an attempt to staunch the flow of blood. The wound was not a deep one. My companion was more dazed than hurt. But what of the pursuers? I took the weapon from his grasp and examined it hurriedly. It was not unlike the automatic pistol to which I was accustomed, except that it apparently fired with a button instead of a trigger. I inserted several fresh rounds of ammunition into its magazine from my companion's belt as rapidly as I could, for I soon heard, near us, the suppressed conversation of his pursuers. There followed a series of explosions round about us, but none very close. They evidently had not spotted our hiding place and were firing at random. I waited tensely, balancing the gun in my hand to accustom myself to its weight and probable throw. Then I saw a movement in the green foliage of a tree not far away, and the head and face of a man appeared. Like my companion, he was clad entirely in green, which made his figure difficult to distinguish. But his face could be seen clearly. It was an evil face and had murder in it. That decided me. I raised the gun and fired. My aim was bad, for there was no kick in the gun as I had expected, and I hit the trunk of the tree several feet below him. It blew him from his perch like a crumpled piece of paper, and he floated down to the ground like some limp, dead thing, gently lowered by an invisible hand. The tree, its trunk blown apart by the explosion, crashed down beside him. There followed another series of explosions around us. These guns we were using made no sound in the firing, and my opponents were evidently as much at sea to my position as I was to theirs. So I made no attempt to reply to their fire, contenting myself with keeping a sharp lookout in their general direction. And patience had its reward. Very soon I saw a cautious movement in the top of another tree. Exposing myself as little as possible, I aimed carefully at the tree trunk and fired again. A shriek followed the explosion. I had the tree crash down, then a groan. There was silence for a while. Then I heard a faint sound of boughs swishing. I shot three times in its direction, pressing the button as rapidly as I could. Branches crashed down where my shells had exploded, but there was no body. Then I saw one of them. He was starting one of those amazing leaps from the bough of one tree to another, about forty feet away. I threw up my gun impulsively and fired. By now I had gotten the feel of the weapon, and my aim was good. I hit him. The bullet must have penetrated his body and exploded. For one moment I saw him flying through the air. Then the explosion and he had vanished. He never finished his leap. It was total annihilation. How many more of them there were, I don't know. But this must have been too much for them. They used a final round of shells on us, all of which exploded harmlessly, and shortly after I heard them swishing and crashing away from us through the treetops, not one of them descended to the earth. Now I had time to give some attention to my companion. She was, I found, a girl and not a boy. Despite her bulky appearance, due to the peculiar belt strapped around her body high up under the arms, she was very slender and very pretty. There was a stream not far away, from which I brought water and bathed her face and wound. Apparently, the mystery of these long leaps, the monkey-like ability to jump from bow to bow, 
and of the bodies that floated gently down instead of falling, lay in the belt. The thing was some sort of anti-gravity belt that almost balanced the weight of the wearer, thereby tremendously multiplying the propulsive power of the leg muscles and the lifting power of the arms. When the girl came to, she regarded me as curiously as I did her, and promptly began to quiz me. Her accent and intonation puzzled me a lot, but nevertheless we were able to understand each other fairly well, except for certain words and phrases. I explained what had happened while she lay unconscious, and she thanked me simply for saving her life. You are a strange exchange, she said, eyeing my clothing quizzically. Evidently, she found it mirth-provoking by contrast with her own neatly efficient garb. Don't you understand what I mean by exchange? I mean, uh, let me see, uh, a stranger, somebody from some other gang. What gang do you belong to? She pronounced gang as gan, with only a suspicion of a nasal sound. I laughed. I'm not a gangster. I said, but she obviously did not understand this word. Uh, I don't belong to any gan, I explained, and never did. Does everybody belong to a gan nowadays? Naturally, she said, frowning. If you don't belong to a gan, where and how do you live? Why have you not found and joined a gan? How do you eat? Where'd you get your clothing? I've been eating wild game for the past two weeks, I explained. And this clothing, I, uh, uh, I paused, wondering how I could explain that it must be many hundred years old. In the end, I saw I would have to tell my story as well I could, piecing it together with my assumptions as to what had happened. She listened patiently, incredulously at first, but with more confidence as I went on. When I had finished, she sat thinking for a long time. That's hard to believe, she said. But I believe it. She looked me over with frank interest. Uh, were you married when you slipped into unconsciousness down in that mine? She asked me suddenly. I assured her I had never married. Well, that simplifies matters, she continued. You see, if you were technically classed as a family man, I could take you back only as an invited exchange, and I, being unmarried and no relation of yours, I couldn't do the inviting. Chapter 2. The Forest Gans She gave me a brief outline of the very peculiar social and economic system under which her people lived. At least, it seemed very peculiar from my twentieth-century viewpoint. I learned with amazement that exactly 492 years had passed over my head as I lay unconscious in the mine. Wilma, for that was her name, did not profess to be an historian, and so could give me only a sketchy outline of the wars which had been fought, and the manner in which such radical changes had come about. It seemed that another war had followed the First World War, in which nearly all of the European nations had banded together to break the financial and industrial power of America. They succeeded in their purpose, though they were beaten, for the war was a terrific one, and left America like themselves, gasping, bleeding, and disorganized, with only the hollow shell of a victory. This opportunity had been seized by the Russian Soviets, who had made a coalition with the Chinese to sweep over all Europe and reduce it to a state of chaos. In about 2109, it seems, the conflict was finally precipitated. The Mongolians, with overwhelming fleets of great airships, and a science that far outstripped that of crippled America, swept in over the Pacific and Atlantic coasts, and down from Canada, annihilating American aircraft, armies, and cities with their terrifying disintegrator rays. These rays were projected from a machine not unlike a searchlight in appearance, the reflector of which, however, was not a material substance, but a complicated balance of interacting electronic forces. This resulted in a terribly destructive beam, under its influence, material substance melted into nothingness, i.e. into electronic vibrations. It destroyed all then known substances, from air to the most dense metals and stones. They settled down to the establishment of what became known as the Han Dynasty in America, as a sort of province of their world empire. Those were terrible days for the American, 
They were hunted like wild beasts. Only those survived who finally found refuge in mountains, canyons, and forests. Government was at an end among them. Anarchy prevailed for several generations. Most would have been eager to submit to the Han, even if it meant slavery. But the Han did not want them, for they themselves had marvellous machinery and scientific process by which all difficult labour was accomplished. Ultimately, they stopped their active search for and annihilation of the widely scattered groups of now savage Americans, so long as they remained hidden in their forests, and did not venture near the great cities the Han had built, little attention was paid to them. Families and individuals gathered together in clans, or gans, for mutual protection. They dug underground factories and laboratories that they might better be shielded from the electrical detectors of the Han. They tapped the radio communication lines of the Han, with crude instruments at first, better ones later on. They bent every effort towards the redevelopment of science. For many generations they laboured as unseen, unknown scholars of the Han, picking up their knowledge piecemeal as fast as they were able to. During the earlier part of this period, there were many deadly wars fought between the various Gans, an occasional courageous but childishly futile attack upon the Han. These were followed by terribly punitive raids. Within the Gan, an economy was developed that was a compromise between individual liberty and a military socialism. The right of private property was limited practically to personal possessions, but private privileges were many, and sacredly regarded. Stimulation to achievement lay chiefly in the winning of various kinds of leadership and prerogatives, and only in a very limited degree in the hope of anything that might be classified as wealth, and nothing that might be classified as resources. Resources of every description, for military safety and efficiency, belonged as a matter of public interest to the community as a whole. The Han race, devitalized by its vices and luxuries, with machinery and scientific processes to satisfy its every want, with virtually no necessity of labor, began to assume a defensive attitude toward the American. And quite naturally, the American regarded the Han with a deep and grim hatred. Conscious of individual superiority as men, knowing that latterly they were outstripping the Han in science and civilization, they longed desperately for the day when they should be powerful enough to rise and annihilate the yellow blight that lay over the continent. Wilma told me she was a member of the Wyoming Gang, which claimed the entire Wyoming Valley as its territory, under the leadership of Boss Hart. Her mother and father were dead, and as she was not married, she was thus not a family member. She lived in a little group of tents known as Camp 17, under a woman camp boss with seven other girls. Her duties alternated between military or police scouting and factory work. For the two-week period which would end the next day, she had been on air patrol. This did not mean, as I had first imagined, that she was flying, but rather that she was on the lookout for Han ships over the outlying section of the Wyoming Territory, and had spent most of her time perched in the treetops scanning the skies. Had she seen one, she would have fired a drop flare several miles off to one side, which would ignite when it was floating vertically toward the earth, so that the direction or point from which it had been fired might not be guessed by the airship, and bring a blasting play of the disintegrator ray into her vicinity. Other members of the air patrol would send up rockets on seeing hers, until finally a scout equipped with an ultraphone, which, unlike the ancient radio, operated on the ultronic ethereal vibrations, would pass the warning simultaneously to the headquarters of the Wyoming gang and other communities within a radius of several hundred miles, not to mention the few American rocket ships that might be in the air, and which instantly would duck to cover either through forest clearings or by flattening down to earth in green fields, where their colouring would probably protect them from observation. The favourite American method of propulsion was known as rocketing. The rocket is what I would describe from my 20th century comprehension of the matter as an extremely powerful gas blast, atomically produced through the stimulation of chemical action. Scientists of today regard it as a childishly simple reaction, but by that very virtue most economical and efficient. Wilma cleared up for me the mystery of those flying leaps which she and her assailant had made, and explained in the following manner how the inertron belt balances weight. Jumpers were in common use at the time that I awoke, 
though they were costly, for at that time Inertron had not been produced in very great quantity. They were very useful in the forest. They were belts, strapping high under the arms containing an amount of Inertron adjusted to the wearer's weight and purpose. In effect, they made a man weigh as little as he desired, two pounds if he liked. Floaters are a later development of jumpers, rocket motors encased in Inertron blocks, and strapped to the back in such a way that the wearer floats when drifting, facing slightly downwards. With his motor in operation, he moves like a diver, head foremost, controlling his direction by twisting his body, and by movements of his outstretched arms and hands. Ballast weights locked in the front of the belt adjust weight and lift. Some men prefer a few ounces of weight in floating, using a slight motor thrust to overcome this. Others prefer a buoyance balance of a few ounces. The inadvertent dropping of weight is not a serious matter. The motor thrust can always be used to descend. As an extra precaution, in case the motor should fail for any reason, there are built into every belt a number of detachable sections, one or more of which can be discarded to balance off any loss in weight. Who were your assailants? I asked, and why were you attacked? Her assailants, she told me, were members of an outlaw gang referred to as Bad Bloods, a group which for several generations had been under the domination of a conscienceless leader who tried to advance the interests of their clan by tactics which their neighbours had come to regard as unfair, and who in consequence had been virtually boycotted in Gan trade. Their purpose had been to slay her near the Delaware frontier, making it appear that the crime had been committed by Delaware scouts, and thus embroil the Delawares and Wyomings in acts of reprisal against each other, or at least to cause suspicion. Fortunately, they had not succeeded in surprising her, and she had been successful in dodging them for some two hours before the shooting began at the moment when I arrived on the scene. But we must not stay here talking, Wilma concluded. I have to take you in, and besides, I must report this attack right away. I think we'd better slip over to the other side of the mountain. Whoever is on that post will have a phone, and I can make a direct report. But you'll have to have a belt. Mine alone won't help much against our combined weights, and, and there's little to be gained by jumping heavy. It's almost as bad as walking. After a little search, we found one of the men I had killed, who had floated down among the trees some distance away, and whose belt was not badly damaged. In detaching it from his body, it nearly got away from me and shot up in the air. Wilma caught it, however, and though it reinforced the lift of her own belt so that she had to hook her knee around a branch to hold herself down, she saved it. I climbed the tree, and with my weight added to hers, we floated down easily. 